Yeah, we'll let you David, we're live. We'll let you explain that when we get going. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. On behalf of Understanding Ag and Soil Health Academy, I want to welcome you here this evening uh, to tonight's webinar, Increasing Profitability in a Corn Bean Rotation. We have as our guests this evening, Dan DeSutter, David Brandt, and Understanding Ag Consultant, David Kleinschmidt. So please keep your, your uh, devices on mute. If you have uh, questions, we're going to be taking and answering questions throughout the program this evening. There's, there is not a planned presentation per se. It's simply the opportunity for anyone who wants to ask these three gentlemen questions. So please type your questions into the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. With that, I'm gonna start, introduce David Brandt. David, of course, is probably one of the preeminent pioneers in soil health in the United States and the world for that matter. He farms near Carroll, Ohio. My understanding is he started no-tilling in 1972, cover crops in 1978. David, uh, welcome. Would you please uh, uh, tell everyone a little bit about your operation? Well, thanks, Gabe. Uh, presently, we're farming almost a thousand acres but now, uh, mostly a corn, bean, wheat, uh, uh, rotation with cover crops behind corn and uh, uh, going to beans and then the beans go to wheat and then after the wheat we do a large uh, multiple species covers that can grow longer and get bigger uh, like maybe you see in the picture where the crop roller is. Uh, that happened to be a field of rye that we harvested in the spring or summer the year before and then come in and planted that 10-way species you see in that picture and uh, uh, really have enjoyed learning how to use uh, single species covers and then dual species covers. And now the big thing push that we're on is learning how to use uh, eight, nine, and 10, 11 uh, different species at one time to really improve the soil, build organic matter, increase water infiltration, and develop our livestock underneath the soil that we feed with those covers. All right, thank you, David. Next, I'm gonna call on Dan DeSutter. Dan is the principal in DeSutter Farms near Attica, Indiana, along with his wife, Barb, and their sons. Dan, welcome this evening. Please tell us a bit about your farm. Uh, thanks, Gabe, and uh, I just wanna say that, you know, uh, what a pleasure it is to have gotten to know you and Gabe, or you and Dave Brand have inspired us and we wouldn't be doing what we're doing today if it hadn't been for the example you set and getting to visit your farms. And, and I'm really thrilled that, uh, you know, I've got uh, three sons who are all interested in coming back to the farm and two of them are back full time now. One just finished school and gonna spend a little time working off farm. Uh, but uh, we, uh, have been, uh, my dad started at Ridge Till in 1983, and then uh, that's how I grew up. Uh, when I came back, got involved in the farm in 91, we transitioned to no-till and started using cover crops around 2000, and also finishing some grass-fed beef. Uh, about four years ago, we made the decision to uh, certify everything organic, so today uh, we're almost 100% certified organic and uh, we've got a couple hundred mama cows and finishing those uh, calves on grass and selling grass fed beef. And our primary crops are organic corn and soybeans and forages and of course cover crops and a little bit of wheat, um, et cetera. All right, thank you, Dan. And finally, we have David Kleinschmidt uh, David has been, he is a partner in understanding ag and also uh, does a lot of work in, on corn and bean operations. David, 
tell us a little bit about what you're seeing this year. Yeah, it all just just depends on what part of the country we're in, you know. Um, looking at some parts of southern Illinois and you know southern Indiana through parts of Kentucky and all uh, parts of Missouri, it's been extremely flooded um, with a lot of rainfall early on this spring, and seems to be. Don't mean to rub this in, Gabe, but we we continue to catch some rains and. That's put a lot of stress on the, the crops in those areas and then, um, you know, in other areas, they just keep getting timely rains and the crops look pretty good. Um, a lot of replant out there, which has always been a, a challenge with cover crops is how do you replant into them um, and nitrogen management and everything with that as well. So that's some of the things I'm seeing. I've heard, uh, you know, out of Kansas, uh, the guys I'm working with out there, some really phenomenal wheat yield this year, so it's uh, pretty good for them as well. Great. Thank you, David. So I'm going to start off first question, and I'm going to direct this towards David Brandt. David, what led you to start planting cover crops? Well, when we started in uh, 71, 72, uh, we run corn and beans. Uh, for three years, did pretty well. The fourth year, we started seeing yields going down. Uh, had to make a decision whether we was going to try to go back to doing tillage. Well, I didn't have time to do that. So we looked into using uh, clovers and sweet clovers uh, as single species, planted them, planted corn into them, and saw a remarkable change. And our yields went back up to where they were. And uh, really, that's how we got started with covers uh, in the 78. And, you know, from there, we just kept playing around and trying to figure out which ones work the best. All right. Have David, have you been able to significantly reduce your fertility inputs? And if so, by approximately what percentage? Uh, right now, we're we're uh, we're close to sixty percent reduction on uh, uh, nutrients and about seventy percent reduction on chemicals. We still rely on a little chemical uh, just because some springs uh, is not making our cover crops grow well enough that we can use a crop roller to terminate them. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm not smart as Dan is because I can't get my, I don't think I can get organics to work because I'm too lazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was I like a little chemical in my back pocket, you know. <laughs> That that was a segue to you then, Dan. Dan, uh, tell me a little bit about your transition into covers and how you've seen them fit into your operation. Well, um, believe it or not, um, my dad had had some experience with covers back in the 80s and they weren't good. And uh, so we weren't even, wasn't on our radar and we had a, a friend of ours, a professor at Purdue University that needed a place to do some annual ryegrass research trials and I asked if we had a field that we'd allow her to use and we agreed to do it. And Dr. Eileen Kodifko and she taught us a lot about earthworms and no-till and lots of good stuff. So we thought we'd return the favor. And so we planted annual ryegrass when she said plant and we sprayed it when she said spray and, and didn't really pay a lot of attention to it until one spring day I was out uh, fixing tile holes. It was the second week in April and We'd had annual ryegrass seeded after the soybeans the previous fall. And I'm down in a hole about four feet deep. And uh, I'm looking down and seeing roots down there. And I'm like, what in the world is going on here? And, and mind you, we were transitioning to no-till a lot of acres at that time. And, and we were told that the key to successful transition was to get rid of that plow pan. And, and we had an old unperverse zone till, uh, no-till ripper that we were using on our 4440 that we had turned up, pulling the guts out of it, trying to get 12, 13 inches deep. And here we had Swiss cheese roots going down four feet deep between crops. And that was, that was the moment when some things clicked and started to look at the world a little differently. That, that was your aha moment there. I remember you telling me that story. That's fantastic. And what cover crops That's are you one using of them. today, Dan? Oh my, we, 
we try to be as diverse as we can. Uh, obviously, cereal rye is a staple for us because there's a certain percentage of the time when the crop's coming off late enough in the fall that there's few things that we can still seed and get to grow and survive winter and have something green and growing. Our philosophy is the most important thing is to have something green and growing all the time. And the more diverse we can make it, the better. So uh, we're, we're using, uh, we love Balanza Clover, uh, Harry Vetch. Um, we use a lot of sorghum sedan and millet and sunflower and buckwheat and, uh, you know, all the, all the radish and, and all the different rapes and so forth. Um, you know, we're, we're really trying to focus on functional diversity now uh, as opposed to just species and, and trying to get as much functional diversity in, in different types of plants in our mixes as we can and as the situation will allow. Great, great, thank you. Talking about cover crops, I'm gonna share screen here and I'm going to, David, I am going to, whoops. Looks like I'm gonna to have to, hmm. I'm gonna try and pull up here if it works. The PowerPoint here and David, I have here, why don't you talk about this um, diverse mix here. This photo was taken at David Brant's just uh, a, a month or so ago. David, why don't you talk a little bit about this mix and how you use it? Uh, I hope this, I don't see it, Gabe, but I, I know what, you're, what you took pictures of. So I will talk about it a little bit, it has, uh, it had a 10-way species in it uh, early in uh, the fall of the uh, year before. Oh, there it is, the year before. And Gabe's got the varieties all there. Uh, uh, we had about 27,000 pounds of green biomass the day we were in the field planting. Uh, and uh, was able to terminate that with a crop roller. We rolled ahead of the planter. And after the planter, it didn't seem to make much difference. Uh, uh, grandson Chris uh, is on the farm now and he runs the planter. He would rather plant without it being rolled because it was easier to follow the marks. Uh, but uh, we're just real impressed with it. Uh, our Haney test said that we had 213 pounds of nitrogen, uh, 68 pounds of phosphorus, 240 pounds of potash, 60 pound of calcium and 10 pound of magnesium in the soil before or after we put the cover on. And, uh, and that was what the soil sample increased just had by having that cover there. Okay, so describe a little bit, David. So you followed a winter wheat crop with this diverse mix, correct? Correct, and we like and this diverse mix to allow it to grow as long as we possibly can. Uh, to get the height of it. And that's why we do it after a small grain crop. So when would you have seeded this mix approximately? Uh, approximately July the 20th to the 25th. Okay. Right after the uh, cereal crop was harvested. And then we just let it grow. Uh, half of the species we plant die over the winter. And we expect the other half to survive and make this kind of cover. And I just switched slides there, David. I know your internet's a little slow. So this is photo when taken at David's. He actually planted first and then went back and rolled it down. And David, what, what success did you have with termination of this cover? Uh, we were fortunate this time because uh, the hairy vetch was probably, I'm gonna say at least 90% in bloom with very little pod activity. Uh, it was a vetch that came from Australia, which we the first time we'd ever tried that vetch, but I really liked it because it all came to bloom. And we had 100% kill of everything. And wow. the corn in it right now is about knee high. And this was done on the 28th. I think you were here to take movies that day. And that's when we did it. Yeah. Yeah. David Kleinschmidt, do you have anything to add to that? You were there that day. Um, yeah, uh, you know, as you can see, primarily the most dominant species in that mix was the hairy veg. 
So, uh, you know, it pretty much had taken over anything else that was out there. Um, it's pretty interesting to watch them plant into it. And I think, uh, David, you had mentioned that Chris is having a little problems with, uh, some sharing off bolts on the, the road markers when he was yeah. going through some of those heavy mixes. So yeah. uh, it was really interesting to watch him go through it. I I actually have a video here I'll bring up and play. This is not at David Brant's, but this shows planting into a diverse cover crop mix prior to rolling. While you're getting that up, Gabe, I think the nicest thing was that, you know, we had a lot of crimson clover there early, and it had pretty well matured by the time we got there to, to do the video shoot for you, and that's why the vetch was so much more dominant than anything else right there then, you know. David Kleinschmidt, if you would, talk a little bit about um, the uh, challenges that some perceive to have in planting into a living cover like that? Most people would look at that and say, what all do I need to add on to my planter? And really, less is more. Uh, depending on, you know, if you're just getting started um, into cover crops and, and no-till, you know, your soils may not be resilient enough and aggregated enough, you know, to, um, you might have to use some, some down pressure as far as hydraulic down pressure, um, down force or, or air, you know, but I think a lot of people are running hydraulic. Um, closing wells would be the other thing, you know, just to watch, um, you know, making sure that you've got closing wells that aren't going to wrap up on anything and to make sure it really stitches that soil back together. But those are really the main two things that a person would really need. And to make sure you've got good sharp double disc uh, openers on there and planting into a cover crop really is, is green. It's just super easy. Um, this picture you just pulled up, Gabe, this is a farmer in Southern Illinois and, uh, I think that cover crop was, there's some crimson clover, hairy vetch, black oaks, um, I think what else, uh, probably some rape seeds and, and some annual ryegrass in there. And that was just planted into it. Um, so he rolled it first and then planted into it green. And as you can see, he had no row cleaners, no um, no till culture, or anything like that on his corn planter and he planted right through it and then you know that's the corn coming up through there I mean it just takes a little bit longer to come up through there um, takes a little bit more scouting but once it comes up it's just beautiful very uniform stand the, how, the how, thick is, how thick David do you think that thatch layer is there oh it, it was every bit about three inches thick the tick is patience. I mean, if you're going to plant into a standing cover crop like that, uh, making sure that the soil conditions are correct to even be in there to begin with, you know, it can be really deceiving because you're driving on top of all that cover crop that's distributing out the weight so much more uniform across, you know, that, that surface area, the tires, the planter and everything that you can get out into a field when it's a little, wet when you probably shouldn't be out there so you know digging in the soil um seeing how much moisture you have in there to know if you really should be in there or not otherwise you can cause a lot more damage um than what you should be um so yeah okay thank you david we have a number of questions coming in so i'm gonna dive right into them um david kleinschmidt Here's a question. Tyrell asks, would planting buckwheat with soybeans solely as a companion, uh, would it work to blow it out the combine? Would that be a viable option? 
He wants yeah, to plant so, buckwheat with the soybeans. Yes. Okay. Yep. So there's some people that have done that. I've heard, I haven't personally experienced this yet, but um, I know that I've heard some concerns about the purple staining on the soybean seeds actually from the buckwheat. But yeah, I mean, that can be done. It's nice because it flowers early. So it um, is bringing in some pollinators in there and some beneficial as well. Um, we also have some guys that are um, using like a pound to a pound and a half of a sunflower and planting sunflowers and soybeans together at the same time and seeing that five to eight percent increase in yield just from that, you know, and you know, the jury's out of what was what it providing, you know, could it be some nutrient uh, exchanging happening in the soil through mycorrhizal networks uh, or could it just be the fact that it's providing um, a habitat for those beneficial predators um, and, and the pollinators. But yeah, no problem with it going right out the back of the machine. Yeah, perhaps could be a much deeper taproot too, uh, bringing nutrients from deeper in the soil profile also. David Brandt, David wants to know, after crimping the 10-way mix, was any herbicide used? No, no, we did not use a herbicide, especially on that big tall stuff. When it all lays down, don't pop up, it will pretty well terminate itself. Thank you, David. Lynn asks, how do you handle rodents in fields like that? Um, oh, go ahead, Dan. One, one thing I've found is when you, we found this by accident, but we have terrible hole issues. And when we started using the roller, it was a really pleasant surprise that wherever we rolled down at planting or either right before or right after planting, it pretty well took care of the voles anyway. I'm not sure about all rodents, but the voles kind of went away. Hmm. Interesting. David Brandt, did you have a comment about well, that? I think, I, think, I think one nice thing that we've kind of left go is we left some of the coyotes around. And, you know, the natural predator seems to take out the vole. We've not had a vole problem since we've been not leaving the coyotes run. We used to kill them, but uh, since we lost our groundhogs, I decided the coyotes were more important than the groundhogs, you know. So then we got rid of the mice problems, and we have an awful lot of hawks, too. And, you know, if you're having a problem, a lot of times you can put a perch out for them to set on. So if it's a big field, you know, if it's a 50 or 60 acre field, put about five or six perches out so the hawks can land and watch. And they'll take care of a lot of the rodents, you know. All right. Thank you. Mark uh, uh, asks a question, and I believe this is uh, directed to you, David Kleinschmidt. On the particular photos that we showed, what did they spray that crop with, that corn crop after planting? I believe he used um, right at planting time. Uh, that, that was last year. I'm trying to remember what he used. But I believe he sprayed Halix GT. So okay. dual Callisto um, with some glyphosate and maybe a half pound of atrazine with that as well. Okay, here's a question from Leo from Coastal, South Carolina. Leo states, we have a hard pan with various soil type from sandy to heavy. Just starting cover crop, will I be able to get away with putting this, I wonder if he means giving the strip till up. What have you had or luck with on a closing wheel planting green. Dan DeSutter, we'll start with you on that one. We've, we've played around with a lot of different things and, and it's kind of like a race car, you know, the setup at the super speedway is different from the half mile track at Bristol. But I would say for planting green, especially if you're worried about wrapping, the thing we found that is most aggressive and doesn't seem to wrap is the uh, Martin um, cupped razor. And uh, in combination with the, I think it's precision tillage technology that makes the, the opener that on a green planter anyway, gives you the offset leading edge. And uh, 
it actually starts the closing process at the opener a little bit. It makes it easier to close no matter what we are using, but that combination has worked pretty well for us in heavy green wrappy type conditions. Thank you, Dan. David Brandt, any comments? Yeah, I agree with Dan. Uh, you can use the cast iron wheels, but if you set them uh, on the uh, mounting bracket, there's two sets of holes on each side. If you'd set one in the front hole and one in the back hole, it'll close a lot better. And uh, don't apply 100% of the spring weight. Keep it, in the, keep it in the middle or light, and it'll do a lot better than if you put all the weight on it, it'll take. Okay, David Kleinschmidt. I'd agree uh, with what Dan just uttered said too, especially with those STP blades. Those disc openers are really good uh, for cutting through the residue and, and those tight soils as well. Um, you know, there are all kinds of different closing wells between the cast and the, the polys and the spikes, you know. Uh, I've had pretty good luck with uh, copper heads and yetter twisters. Um, without wrapping, but everybody's going to have their own preference on what they like, kind of. Okay. David Brandt, Tim asks, when terminating a mix, like the one you had with the roller crimper, what is the optimal time to roll so those covers are terminated? And what species terminate best with the crimper? Optimal time on a crimper is when the plants are close to being fully bloom. Uh, the plants also have to have a hollow stem. Uh, rye grass will not crimp and roll. You can roll it down, but it won't kill it. Uh, but if the plants you tend to pick tends to have a hollow stem, like uh, balance clover or crimson clover, uh, uh, balance clovers, uh, peas, uh, rye, barley, uh, triticale, they all roll extremely well once they're in head. If they're not in head and not seeing a little bloom pollen on the bottom of them, they will spring back up, you know. Thank you, David. Hey, Gabe, if I may yes. add to sure. that comment, you know, like this year, there was a lot of areas that caught some late season frost in the late part of April. And some of that rye didn't roll down at antithesis like it should have. Uh, but if we waited until after antithesis, it rolled not a problem. The only problem with that, though, now is there's a lot of viable seed out there. So just be cautious of that. Very good point. Thank you, David. I'm going to direct this one to each one of you. Jason asks, I've read from a couple of regenerative farmers of poor results with single species covers. Jason's just moving down this path and would like to know, should he try a two to four species mix right out of the gate or what would you suggest? Dan, we'll start with you. Well, I guess I need a little more information as far as what crop is gonna follow, when are you gonna plant, are you using chemicals? Are you trying to terminate exclusively with the roller? But having said that, without knowing those things, I, I, I would say more is merrier. And uh, the de degree of difficulty does go up, but we know that in nature, we have tremendous diversity and that's what we're trying to mimic. So we wanna try to get as much functional diversity in the different plants we're including in our mix as we possibly can. And, and I'm sorry, Dan, I should have added, I, I know Jason, and I know it's a primarily a corn bean rotation. It is not organic, uh, and it is located in southern Minnesota. Uh, when would you be able to see? Yeah, and, and I would say there, they, they'd be planting uh, corn in uh, early May. When would you be able to seed the cover crop? Oh, the cover crop. They're going to have to, yeah, and I, I'm only guessing here on behalf of Jason, but um, the cover crop would, uh, they're going to have to add some diversity to the mix and follow a um, early harvested small grain 
winter wheat typically it would be coming off end of July, first of August. Well, in that case, you know, it makes like what Dave you showed earlier of days is awesome. Yeah. I mean, uh, it covers a lot of the bases. You got warm season, you got cool season, you got legumes, you got grasses, cereals, you got brassicas. Um, you're, you're, you know, that would be a great starting point in my opinion. David Brandt? Well, if he's just, to me, if he's just starting, and I go, I go 100% with what Dan just said, if he's going to go to corn after small grains, yes. If he happens to be in a corn bean rotation and he's just starting, then I'd look at something a little simpler, like a two-way mix or a three-way mix with rye, uh, radishes, uh, rape, uh, Ethiopian cabbage uh, would be my choice going to beans because we really don't want to put much legume in our mixes if they're going to go to soybeans because it tends to be like I am. They get uh, the beans get happy and fat because of all the free nitrogen in the soil and then they don't produce seed. So if we can take the nitrogen and suspend it in the roots of the cereals and the brassicas, the soybeans will set more nodules and they'll produce more beans. Uh, and don't expect so too awful much as far as depth and breaking hard pans up if it's just going to only grow for two or three weeks before it freezes because they just don't have the ability to get very deep in that short period of time. Yeah. David Kleinschmidt, would you like to talk a little bit and answer Jason's question about the termination? Um, obviously, if you get a very, very diverse mix, it's going to be difficult to terminate that with a roller crimper. You want to discuss that a bit? Yeah, and, you know, a couple of things that were running through my mind here, too, is whenever I'm looking at you know, working with somebody and, and helping them to design a cover crop mix, I want to know what your goals are, what your resource concerns are. But the first thing I want to look at is a Haney test and a PLFA test. I want to see where you actually stand with CO2 respiration, what, uh, you know, how, how much microbial activity you have, how much uh, fungal to bacteria you have in that, that system, and then tweak those um, mixes based on what your soils are telling us right now. Um, as far as termination of that, you know, if you're going to use a diverse mix and have, let's say, annual ryegrass in there, if you could get it to overwinter in your environment there, um, and you've got a lot of tall species, if you were to just use chemical, you're probably going to miss that annual ryegrass because it's going to be so much shorter than other species. Um, typically, that's where I tell guys to roll it down first and then try to come in and, and spray it to try to terminate it. Um, that, yeah, it, it's all, you know, in, in those, depending on, you know, especially as you go north into those shorter growing seasons or um, those short, those cooler climates and you got shorter growing seasons and everything, it's really difficult to use a roller crimper um, and, and do an effective job. Thank you, David. Uh, David Brandt, here's a question about your 10 way mix that we showed. Daniel would like to know if you could plant either soybeans or corn following that mix. Uh, corn is the only thing I would suggest to plant. If we plant beans in there, uh, you're probably I'm going to get 10 bushels of acre because they'll be they'll be 25 foot tall and no pods, you know, because there's so much free nitrogen in that soil that. Uh, Things just will not respond, you know. So corn is the only answer. Or if it was in a case where you're in a corn wheat rotation where you had that long, wheat would be all right because it's a grass also and would use that extra nitrogen up for a small grain. Okay. Thank you, David. Dan, here's a good question for you. Ricardo asks, what is some advice to a student researching about cover crops in on-farm research with farmers who have never planted any of them before? I give you the easy ones there, Dan. <laughs> uh, well, 
I would say that's a case where you want to you want to start simple, uh, as Dave referred to, and and you know you want to try to balance the need for diversity with the need for simplicity. In that case, um, you know, depending on the context of when you're planting, if you're coming out to a cereal, maybe you start off with mixes that are going to winter kill. Um, I sure like to let things grow in the spring and have something green and growing, but that is a little more complex and some of the challenges you face there. So maybe with the first timer, you don't go there. Um, have a lot of patience, try to help the farmer understand. Uh, it, it, for a farmer to want to do these things and take these risks and spend the extra money and go the extra effort and time and labor and equipment, you have to understand the why. So you have to explain to that farmer why it is we're doing this and manage his expectations because he's probably not going to see a difference in the first year and, uh, and make sure they understand that this is a long-term process. We're trying to build soil here and you're not going to do it all in one year. And, and, and I think if you do all those things, you set the foundation for a more successful uh, outcome than if you uh, try to do too much too fast without adequate understanding of the why. That excellent advice there. I'd like to add to that, Gabe. If I David. Could. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I think I think really what we need to do with with beginners is go slow, like Dan was talking about, but always try to encourage them that it's not going to look like the neighbor's farm that's conventional because the soil is dark or brown or light and something green growing on it and the rows are straight and they look good, but when you plant into a green cover and it turns brown. It's, uh, it takes a little longer for that plant to, to look really good. Uh, and a lot of times guys get discouraged the first year of saying, man, that is ugly, <laughs> you know. And, uh, but the proof's in the grain tank, you know. The proof's in the grain tank. Yeah, I, would, I would argue with you a little bit, David. I'd say the proof's in oh. the billfold. Well, yeah, but if it's not in the tank, it's not going to be in the billfold game. So. Yeah, yeah. David Brandt, uh, the question from Jake, how deep do you try to plant when you're planting through that thick residue? We try to, we try to get an inch and a half into the soil. Inch and a half deep? Yeah, Dan, inch and a half any... deep in the soil. That's it. Is that because we got about should... two and a half or three inches of cover to protect the plant. Uh, and we still get good brace roots. We still get the kind of things we want to do. And uh, the corn comes up a lot quicker than when it's a two and a half or three inches deep. And it don't need to be that deep because our soils are damper and they're cooler all during the summer. So it continues to grow, even though it's a little hot and droughty other places, you know. Dan, would you agree with that? Probably not. Well, I'm not going to disagree with the master. And... Uh... I would say that that may, would make me nervous. I tend to be more of a two, two and a half inch guy because I don't want it any, I'm okay with an inch and a half. I don't want it any shower. And the fact of the matter is that there's typically some variation out there in this. So if you set the planter at two inches, you'll end up with some an inch and a half and some at two and a half. And I'd rather be maybe a half to three quarters inch deeper. I'm, I'm probably closer to two and a half than one and a half most of the time. But, but maybe that's not the right thing. I, I just know that um, when, you're, when, you're, when you introduce that buffer layer and the variation that comes from it, um, I, I'd rather be a little on the deep side and maybe I'm a little too deep, but um, that'd be my bias. Yeah. David Kleinschmidt, break this tie. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I'd just like to say that you know, it just depends. I'll use that word, right? <laughs> so takes the easy it, way out. It, yeah, ahead. because yeah, exactly. You know, you ob obviously you need to compensate for your cover crop mass residue, right? And that's gonna that can vary throughout the field too. So, you know, you could have it set deep enough in some areas, and then you get to an area that's a really heavy cover crop, and now it's shallow. You know. So you always need to check that. But the biggest thing is check your moisture of your soil when you're planting. Because if, you're, if it's too wet and you're out there and you stick that thing two inches deep, good luck. 
it's going to be rotten. Mm-hmm. Yep. So I'm, I'm going to be in that inch and a half to two inch mark, but it's just going to depend. <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> it, it, it just depends, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I'm gonna side with Dan. I'm gonna I'm gonna set it at at two inches and go a little both ways. <laughs> so now there's no tiebreaker. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we have a question from two questions from uh, Kevin. Question one: With all of the crimped residue, is there a slug issue on the new plants coming up? David Kleinschmidt. So again. Um, the more diversity that we have in those mixes, the more that we can bring those beneficial uh, predators into that uh, environment to basically control the slug. There's some interesting uh, research coming out of Penn State looking at slugs and the neonic insecticides on the seed treatment and basically it took about three years of plot work of using no neonics to have a crowded beetle population high enough to actually control the slug. Um, you know, it really depends on the year. I mean, a really wet year, those slugs are going to be there, you know, and they can live in the soil for quite a while before they come up, you know, back out. So they're always there. It's kind of like a snail. A snail can li- live in its shell for seven years, and then as soon as the right environment comes out, you know, they're there. But um, wet years, you're going to maybe see them a little bit heavier than on um, on the drier years. But with the diversity, typically I'm not seeing them as bad. David or Dan? Any yeah, I'd like to add to that. And Dan will follow up. He'll, he'll contradict what I'm going to say, but we got, we got to, uh, as a no-tiller and a cover crop guy, uh, you know, we were the slug capital of the world in the 80s. I mean, it was not impossible to see 50 or 75 slugs on a corn plant on our farm. But what we've learned from that was that we did not want to compete with a neighbor to be the oldest one planting corn. Because if you have that cover, the soils are cooler, they're damper. So the hardest job is learn to just set, set on your hands or go on vacation the first two weeks in May. You know, just get the hell away so you can't see them new tractors running in the field. But plant later, get the soil warm. I, we found if the soil was 60 degrees and we're planting and we have a slug pressure problem, guess what? That corn can outgrow it. If it's gonna be 60, the next day it may be 90 degrees or 80 degrees and dry it out. The only reason the slug's there is because the soil's damp and cold. You know, and we quit using uh, neonics uh, six years ago. We quit using insecticides 10 years ago. And uh, uh, our crabbit beetles and uh, lightning bugs, if you have light, one lightning bug is not enough, but if you have 500 when you look out your window, uh, they'll eat a lot of slugs, you know. But just remember, take the neonic off because if, it, if the slug crawls over the neonic on the corn, and the crab beetle or the lightning bug attacks it, it dies and the slug keeps growing. Get the soil warm, get the plants up and it'll outgrow it. Yeah. Dan was giving you a thumbs up, so he's not gonna argue and uh, neither would I. Since we start stopped using, we haven't used any seed treatments at all in six or seven years. And the, the key to making that work is patience. Yes. And I agree with the 60 degree rule. You want the plant to be able to outgrow the pest. And uh, we we have slugs around, but they're never really a material issue if we follow that simple rule. Yeah. And there's another thing you could do. You could move to North Dakota because we sure don't have any slugs here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to call on Doug Peterson, Understanding Ag Consultant. Kevin asked a question here. How long will it take for the cover crop residue to cycle through. Doug, can you give us a, a uh, quick lesson on mineralization and immobilization? Wow, um, <clears throat> I guess that's gonna kind of depend on on where you're at. Obviously temperature is a, plays a big part in that. Um, s- studying and understanding your, your carbon nitrogen ratio and, and how, how that works is one of the best things you can do. I don't know that we have time to do that tonight, Gabe, but 
um, that uh, understanding that is is the most critical thing you can do. Um, understand that carbon to nitrogen ratio and how how that works. Um, again, temperature and moisture both drive that nutrient cycle. Um, both of those have a have a huge impact on biology in the soil. So if it's dry, you're not going to have much cycling going on. Um, if it's cold, you're not going to have much cycling going on. So, you know, I mean, Gabe's a great example. Far, farther north you are, you're just, you're going to have higher organic matter because you're not going to be cycling those, uh, that, that carbon, that organic matter through for, for a longer period of time. You know, the farther south you go, uh, you're, you're going to have lower organic matter levels because it's going to cycle a much, much bigger part of the year. Do you want to talk a little bit, if you would, please, Doug, about that carbon nitrogen ratio? Um, for instance, we showed pictures there of, of David Brandt's cover crop, a lot of vetch and crimson clover. Talk about the difference between that and a cereal rye cover crop. So, so the, the carbon nitrogen ratio of the cover crop obviously is going to have a have a big impact on how fast it cycles. The higher the carbon, the slower it's going to cycle. Um, the the lower the carbon to nitrogen ratio. For example, if it's hairy vetch, clovers, um, really short, lush ryegrass um, is going to cycle very quickly. Anything that that's very lignified, that's very tall, very rank. Um, it, cereals, wheat, rye, trit, if they're all fairly mature, they're going to they're gonna cycle very slowly. Um, and again, it just comes back to how, how those organisms um, break those down. The higher the carbon, the, the, more, uh, the more time, the more organisms it's going to take to break those down. Thank you, Doug. Appreciate that. David Brandt, Kevin asks, any concern with volunteer covers in soybeans such as rapeseed and radish seed? Uh, haven't seen much. We, we do have a little rape and a little hairy vetch coming. Uh, never been a problem as far as harvest goes. Uh, uh, have never been docked for FM or anything in the soybeans. I think that most some of that seeds light enough that the combine's got enough air that's going to blow it out uh, has not been a problem. Uh, the only problem we see with rye seed is where we're trying to grow certified wheat, and uh, you know there's a case now and then when uh, some of that rye has matured that we've rolled the year before, and it come back and bites you in the butt a little bit, and you have to go out and trim it out. You know, but those are some of the things that you. You know the management strategy of it, and I think with some new rise that's coming on the market, such a hybrid rye and hybrid triticale, this is going to solve the problem for the guys that want to grow wheat. Because if it's a hybrid, it won't put on a viable seed head the next year. So that's something to look into. Dan, more expensive, anything? but something to look into. Dan, anything to add to that? Well, uh, we're learning. <laughs> <laughs> We've got uh, soybeans that have some alfalfa in them. I just cut some wheat that had some alfalfa left in it. I know that's not necessarily a volunteer issue, but it's not an experience I hope to ever repeat. I can tell you that. Um, we This is our first year to use a lot of hairy vetch, and I, I've got concerns about that as a potential weed in soybeans and wheat as well. And and uh, the lesson we learned this year is one of patience and, and uh we got out there a little early and uh, ours didn't lay down as flat and as nice as Dave's did. So, um, but radish, I don't think it's a big problem. Um, buckwheat, I haven't seen that be a big issue. I, I don't mind seeing a little buckwheat growing uh, volunteer. Um, probably the big one that, that I, and we have, you know, we have a lot of rye that we manage in our soybeans. Uh, we, we have seen a time or two when the rye content in the tank gets up to, you know, a measurable amount at the elevator, but so far it hasn't been unmanageable. Okay, thank you. Maggie asks, do roller crimpers work well on sloped 
highly contoured fields and can they work on fields with lots of point rows? David? Well, uh, you know, you know, I want to look at the configuration of the roller. You know, it's a 20 foot roller. It will not roll in the valleys and the depths, but you can buy rollers that are in five to six to seven foot increments that float up and down for the contour. And they'll work really well, you know. Uh, and that's not been a problem as far as I know, if we can address it when we talk to the person that wants to talk about a crop roller, because uh, if they don't, if they, we assume in way calls us, they'll tell us the truth. Of, if, uh, you know, if we say you have flat ground, they say yes, well, then they could use a 60 foot roller and it'd roll all the way across. But if you happen to have terraces, that's not going to work, you know. Yeah. David Kleinschmidt, anything to add there? No, I just echo it what David said and there's a lot of different companies or a couple of different companies out there making some crop rollers and um, as long as they're in shorter segments going through terraces and stuff not a problem as far as point rows and stuff go I haven't had any problems with that at all so okay okay Dan here you have a fellow Hoosier asking uh when we have a late corn harvest is there any companion to put with either wheat or cereal rye, such as a legume. The next year will be in beans. This is my second year as no-till and using covers, so I am new to it. We try to get beans er in early, if possible. Well, as Dave mentioned earlier, I don't think you, you should have as a goal to put a legume in a mix preceding soybean. So, and, and that's fortunate because I can't think of anything that if you're harvesting really late, you're gonna to get to survive the winter anyway. Uh, I think cereal rye, we've played around with some rape and different things. It, again, it comes down to how you're gonna control it. If you're trying to do it strictly with a roller or if you're gonna use chemicals, uh, but uh, you know, that's, that's why rye is, is the foundation cover crop is because I, I've planted it as late as dang near Christmas before. And, and had it survive and, and, and come on and do its job pretty well. Now, if you're looking for that as your weed control in an organic situation, uh, definitely not optimal. Uh, the other thing we're learning is that, you know, we can compensate for later planting dates by increasing our seeding rates. And that helps to get the biomass we need for the weed suppression, but we're finding that the thinner stems that we get with those bigger populations and later plantings don't crimp as well as a timely seeded cover crop uh, that has a chance to tiller. The thicker stems definitely make it easier to kill it with a crimper. Good advice. So David Brandt, David asks if you no tilled in that 10 way mix. Yes. We did. Yeah. Yes, just put it in a drill, uh, calibrate the drill so you get the right amount on, and just get started. Really easy. Thank you, David. David Kleinschmidt, Ellis asks, what do you think about planter mounted roller crimpers? Are they as effective as separate units? They do a good job, but there's a couple different ones out there between my some guys are using the Yetter Stock Devastator, and then you got the Don ZRX. Um, you know, the biggest thing that I have uh, concern with them is, you know, you have to then plant when that cover crop is ready. Um, you know, if you know, we're able to actually plant soybeans earlier and then come back at the V2, so two trifoliates on them and use a roller crimper and terminate the rye uh, while those beans are up and not have any, you know, effect on those beans. You know, that enables us to then get the beans off earlier and to get the good cover crop in that's going to go to corn or to be able to get weed into there in a timely manner as well, rather than waiting until, you know, in like my environment, waiting until the end of May to plant soybeans then I'm not going to get them off until, you know, October, late October, you know, short growth, short days there where I'm not going to dry down as, as much, I'm not going to be able to uh, harvest as efficiently and uh, not going to be able to get my you know, 
legume base uh, with grasses that I'd want for a cover crop going to corn. So I, I agree, it gives you some flexibility, or it, does, it, it takes away some flexibility, but then you don't have to have another piece of equipment, you know, there too. So it's, it's kind of a give and take on both sides. Thank you, David. Shane New, I'm gonna bring you in on this one. Jeremy asks, at what point, or how do you know you have gotten to where fertilizer can start being cut out? And Jeremy states he's been using cover crops for four years. Well, one thing we would definitely do is start utilizing the Haney soils test. Let's see what we have for plant available nutrients within our soil profile. You know, so we have that baseline to do. You know, also we want to do some experimentation on our own, on our own farms or something, you know, most producers, you know, most don't like to try to experiment. I really encourage experimentation you'll do some nutrient reductions on your own you know and do your normal nutrient application and always do a zero check strip and take a look at the difference in yields um, that's a great way to start but i really highly encourage anybody going down this path to start utilizing the haining soils test do a phospholipid fatty acid test and see where you're at and then we can make some good good assessments and determinations on cover crop species and you know, and also determination of the next crop to be planted after you utilize the covers. Gabe, I just want to say one thing. I wish I had every dollar I ever spent on potash and phosphate back. <laughs> <laughs> what are you trying to tell everybody there, Dan? You can draw your own conclusions. <laughs> yeah. David Kleinschmidt, you want to elaborate on Dan's comment a little bit? <laughs> yeah so going back to dan er, early in the conversation or webinar tonight when danny was talking about that rye being four foot deep if we think about our soil test method we're only testing six inches and so these roots are going so much deeper than what we're actually testing for they're pulling up these nutrients deeper in the soil profile bringing them back they cycle out especially potassium Potassium in that, in that tissue of that biomass is water soluble. So once we start catching rains on it after termination, all that potash or potassium is right there for that plant to be able to take up. You know, phosphorus is gonna depend on, you know, the plant species. Some are really quick, some are a little bit slower at releasing. But again, as we build the fungal component of that um, soil, we can start to break down those, those residues a little quicker and to get that release back as well so you know going what shane said you know measure with the haney soils test i recommend sending them to region egg labs uh the plfa test and even doing some uh plant biomass testing i do a three foot by three foot square of that biomass on top send it off to the lab and see at planting time what nutrients are in there what my carbon to nitrogen ratios are on that and then periodically throughout the growing season either every month or every three weeks afterwards go back to that relatively same spot and take that um, another biomass sample of that decay and residue just to see what's been mineralized out and then you can start making your own assumptions do some tissue testing of that crop with it as well see what the crop has taken up what you've mineralized out what your soil's telling you with a haney test at the same time and you can really start to understand what dan's talking about yeah that's right David Brandt, there's a question from Jerry. He would uh, like to know at what depth you're planting that diverse mix. Okay, uh, we're running about an inch deep uh, with everything because we have the large seeds there that'll sprout sooner than the smaller seeds. And they actually will help pull the smaller seeds up from that depth. If, you're having, if your mixes are all small seeds, you want to keep them in that top half inch uh, so they can get up. But if you have sunflowers and uh, peas, uh, those bigger planted, the bigger seed plants, uh, they really will pull up the plants. And a comment I'd like to make on that last question is, I think everybody ought to test their, or run samples to see how well their cover crops are doing. I mean. 
use 50% nit- or 50% less nutrients, uh, maybe 25% less nutrients on part of the fields. Uh, you don't even need to worry about where they're at because if most everybody's got a combine, it's got a yield monitor, you can tell. You know, if you don't see any difference, you know, then you can cut by that much because we don't, we can't make a ruling and say you can cut 25% the second year or 30% because maybe they've only used rye as their cover and they haven't had that diverse root system that's went deep enough to bring up the nutrients that we need. So I Very always good. suggest to use a test. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, if I may, yep. you know, I'll, I'll go back to the, you know, I want a fat wallet type deal. You know, remember what those nutrients, you know, that fertilizer is costing too, and look at ROI on this. So right. if you're going to do some check strips, do some zero as well, and see what your baseline is, and then see your incremental change when you're you're cutting back on on those nutrients, and then compare it to your ROI and make sure, you know, hey, are you wasting money with the fertilizer? Or is it, you know, where's your profit? Shane, you had something. Yeah, to if I may, Gabe. You know, one thing we've been starting to utilize is that total nutrient digestion test as a baseline. See how much nutrients you have in that 12 inch soil profile. I think most guys would be remarkably surprised how much nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and all the other nutrients. But remember, it's, it takes the microbiology to help cycle this and to make it plant available. So it all goes back to your soil health, building the soil microbiome. But if you're starting down this path, definitely do that total nutrient digestion. Get that so you know what you're starting with when you're starting out. Yeah. We we tested 45 farms in Northern Plains and into Canada last year. Average nitrogen, amount of nitrogen per acre to 12 inch depth was 9,000 pounds. Average phosphorus, 2,300 pounds. Average potassium, 11,000 pounds. People, we are not short on nutrients. We are short on biology, plain and simple. We got to get back to realizing that it's a biological system. David Brandt, here's a softball I'm throwing at you. Someone wants to know where they can find all these cover crop seeds to purchase. (laughs) Well, there's there's lots of good seed companies, uh, you know, we, we happen to operate ones called Walnut Creek Seeds, uh, Green Cover Crops, another one, uh, BioTills, a good company. I mean, uh, look at your look at what you're looking for, see what your representative has. Always make sure that it has a good seed tag with germination. My point of call is always ask the question, is the cover crop we're using 50 state of noxious free? Because if you happen to be pulling uh, Cow peas out of Texas, Palmer amaranth is not an obnoxious weed in Texas, but it sure in the hell is in Ohio and the I states also, you know. So uh, just make sure you got, and make sure your seed dealer gives you the right bacteria for those nitrogen fixing plants, or you're not, they're not going to grow nodulation and collect atmospheric nitrogen. The, the correct rhizobia. That's correct, right. David. Thank you. Thank you. Tim asks, if you roll before planting, does it matter if you plant the same direction as the roller? David Brown? As long as it's all laying flat, it makes no difference. But if it's sticking up one way and you're trying to go against it, guess what? It will wrap on the frames and the sprockets. And unless you got a brand new plant that don't have any sprockets anymore, then you don't have to worry about it, you know. But uh, uh, most generally, you like to plant the way you roll. Uh, and we always prefer to roll afterwards because it covers up all our planter mistakes. That's why we roll afterwards. <laughs> Anything to add, Dan or David? Uh, okay. No, you know, I, I think that's that says what me. <laughs> okay. Daniel asks, he asks, I want to plant a multi-species cover crop into winter wheat stubble. I'm going back to winter wheat on some of those acres. What suggestion do you have for a multi-species cover crop in this scenario? Daniel, I think it would be best if you would uh, 
email Kathy at understandingag.com because one of us would need to talk to you to find out more specifics before we could give a recommendation. So please email Kathy and, and one of us will get back to you. Here, Mark is just stating here that he has not had a slug issue since he quit using treated seed. And that's what each of you had said also. Tim asked this, with thick hairy vetch cover crop shown going to corn, was any starter fertilizer used, David Brandt? No, because our soils were warm, above 60 degrees. And, you know, if our soil temperatures are 55 and higher, we use no starter fertilizers at all. So we don't use any really, because we always wait till it gets to 55 or 60. Thank you. Here's a question from Lynn and Dan, I'm gonna ask it to you because she directs it to you. She wants to know if you could talk about how you graze your cover crops. Well, um, that's probably a topic for a whole other evening's uh, discussion, but uh, uh, for instance, uh, we just finished weed harvest. We put down two mixes in areas where we've got fence and infrastructure we did a grazing mix that we hope to stockpile to, to use for winter grazing. Um, we, uh, a lot of times uh, in, this, in the fall, we'll, we'll put down some triticale, peas, kind of combination that gives us early spring grazing. Uh, we'll get, that gives us a place to get our cattle on first thing where we're letting our perennial pastures get some growth and size and maturity to them. Um, we, uh, we also uh, will follow that then with a warm season mix that uh, allows us to get off those perennial pastures then to stockpile them for winter. Uh, we, we use that window of late summer when, when the, our perennial pastures tend to kind of fall off and, and not have the greatest nutrient content. Can, content. Um, we get better uh, you know, finishing type grade uh, with, with sorghum sedan and pearl millet, those kind of things. And those are just a few of the ways, but, uh, you know, cattle increase the complexity and flexibility of the system by a lot. And it's only limited by your imagination, how you can go about that and utilize that within the context of your overall enterprise. And I'll just take a moment to mention, if you want to learn more about that and see Dan's operation. We're gonna be holding a Soil Health Academy on Dan's farm, Attica, Indiana, August 3rd through the 5th. You can go on the Soil Health Academy website to find more. Next question, William from North Carolina asks, is it better to sow the cover crop before soybean leaf drop or wait until after harvest and drill the cover crop in. The concern we have is the cover crop will get too tall before we get a chance to harvest. David Kleinschmidt, do you want to take that one? Yeah, it really depends on what species that you're going to plant. Um, you know, uh, if you're using any the like a winter pea or any of the larger seeded species there, they really need seed soil contact and need to be drilled in. Uh, veg, so so if you're gonna throw it on top, you know, the clovers work fairly good. Um, radishes work good, you know, the annual ryegrass, oats, stuff like that. You know, you could do that before leaf drop. I have not had experience with them getting too big and too rank, uh, when cutting beans and having an issue there. Um, you know. Typically, the nice thing is that you have a whole lot less depth uh, when you're when you're harvesting those beans. David, Dan, any? Yeah, I'd like to make a comment. Sure. Uh, it's a lot easier to do it with a drill afterwards because you use less seed. Uh, sometimes you don't have the time to get it done. Uh, timing is critical uh, for seedings. Uh, if you do it with a plane or a high boy. Uh, and you do it at first leaf drop, and then we have a rainy event in the fall and delays harvest by three or four weeks. <coughs> Pardon me. 
it can be a problem with the sickle bar uh, trying to get that green stuff off the bar and through the combine. Thank you. Doug, Doug did you have something to add? Yeah, Gabe, one thing I might mention is that we have found that um, I generally wouldn't recommend somebody to fly it on it, it, the first couple of years when they're starting because a lot of times that surface is still doesn't have much aggregate stability and it's really slick and smooth. And four or five years down the road, the surface of that soil will, will have more texture and more undulation and more cracks and fissures for that seed as it's flown on to get into and get better seed to soil contact. So I generally don't recommend flying the first two or three years jumping into a soil health program. Good advice. Okay, Jake asks, he says, I have planted soybeans green into 24 to 30 inch tall triticale cover for the second season this year following corn. I applied 125 pounds MESZ with the drill when planting triticale last fall. No added fertility when planting the beans. I have an experiment going with half of an irrigated circle with tillage and spring fertility, and the other half with trit, no tilled into the corn, and then the beans planted green into the trit. As I am sure you guys would expect, the half into the cover is roughly three trifoliates behind the till side. Is the slow growth normal in this scenario, and should I be concerned or just be patient? Would you recommend any additional starter type program while getting the system to function better? Shane New, that one's got you wrote all over it. Wasn't on my trigger, Gabe, sorry. So, well, first thing is we gotta understand, you know, we're dealing with biology. So um, I'm assuming, you know, you probably have a lot of compaction. So if you take a shovel and stick it in the soil, and pull that soil up, you're probably gonna see a lot of stratification in the soil. I almost assume, because I've seen this today in some fields where I was looking at, you know, the compaction layer is so high up on the soil surface, the soybean roots were actually growing laterally. Um, so they're not able to get any depth into the soil whatsoever. So, <clears throat> you know, one thing we've really got to focus on is building armor on that soil cover, you know, to hold moisture as long as possible to start to allow the microbiology to function, to help start building that soil aggregation. Um, you know, you said you were terminating the cover crop at about 24 to 30 inches tall. Is that correct, Gabe? So he is, he is planting green into the 24 to 30 inches. You know, I would consider letting the cover crop get a little more mature to allow that, keep that armor on the soil longer. Um, it's gonna depend on your rot rotation too. Um, you know, one thing we need to start thinking about starts changing our um, disruptions, our rotations, start getting these biannuals in these systems, because that gives us that window of opportunity to put those large cover crop mixes in to help build soil armor, to provide different carbons, to help feed different soil microbiology. Um, these are some things to consider, but I'm sure it's more uh, due to a lack of compaction, no aggregation in the soil. And it takes time. We work with an ecology. Yeah. So, Jake, I, I will just I think... add a little bit and then turn it over to David Brandt. So, in this particular case, Jake, of course, you're going to see the tilled ground be a bit ahead. But realize the negative ramifications of that tillage pass. Um, you're going to lose aggregation, as Shane said. You're going to lose water infiltration. You're going to lose mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, you're destroying the home for the biology. If you run into a stress period with lack of moisture, uh, that's where the uh, part of the circle that's under the cover will really shine and take off. So what we always like to ask people, are you farming for only this year or are you farming for long term? Because the just doing one tillage pass will literally set an operation back for a number of years. You need to 
uh, build that biology. David? I guess what I, the comment I'd like to make is, you know, he's seeing those beans in that conventional field, mainly because that soil might have been just a shade bit warmer because it didn't have the cover on it. So the plant, the bean plant come up a little quicker uh, uh, in those situations. So it will look a little bigger. It may be a trifolia ahead of it, but keep looking at it, keep watching it, understand the, the context of what we're trying to do here, because as you move toward harvest, and I'll bet you when it's all over, that you'll see a three to a five bushel yield increase where the triticale was planted after the corn. Uh, you took less time and less fuel to plant those soybeans where that cover is, and you will be surprised how much easier that combine will push in that triticale field where the beans are growing, and they will catch those full season beans and maybe surpass them. So look at the bean plant in your conventional as the pods are setting, see how close the nodes are, see how close the pods are, and then look in your triticale field, you'll probably find one or two more pods uh, by trifoliate, and you'll probably end up with one or two more beans in the pod plant just because of that triticale holding some moisture and making that plant have the nutrients it needs. That's the pluses. Dan? Well, I like to, everybody, farmers, we're, we're all guilty of wanting to judge our prowess as farmers by what the crop looks like after we did our part. And we define that as getting the crop planted and off to a start. And that's, but I started going to the Indianapolis 500 when I was 10 years old. I missed my fourth one this year. And the thing I'd like to say is this, very rarely is the car that's fastest at the beginning of the race, the one that's fast at the end. And when it comes to raising crops, you want a car that's fast at the end. And by leaving all that stuff alone, keeping that soil cooler, not burning up your nitrogen with that tillage, you leaving the things in place that'll help that plant finish strong. And uh, don't worry about what it looks like today. Absolutely. Great analogy, great analogy there, Dan. Okay, David Kleinschmidt, this question is directed to you. Lucinda asks, uh, what cover crop would you recommend after soybeans and before corn? It's going to just depend, you know, um, you know, location, what a handy soil test, the field. I mean, there's no static, you know, one size fits all here. Um, a lot of farmers I deal with, we do a field by field situation depending on what that resource concern is on that field. So uh, it's really hard to give somebody a, you know, advice on what to plant without knowing any more information. Okay. I'd like to add that, you know, if she wants to use a cover crop, make sure she understands she may delay her planting time just because that cover crop will, will keep that soil a little cooler and damper, you know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Good point. Uh, ben has a question. Ben, I'm going to ask you to email that question to Kathy at understandingag.com and we'll get back to you with an answer. Uh, Shane New, John wants to know when is the best time to do the Haney and PLFA tests? You know, we'd like to see those tests done in the spring when the soil microbiology starts becoming active. We like to see soil temperatures, you know, as close to 55 degrees as possible. Um, I know that's a challenge for a lot of guys, especially in the northern environments, because they start planting in the, a little colder soils just because of the time of year. So the big thing is also is just be consistent. So if you take the Haney soils test, you know, May the 5th, you know, just mark down the conditions if it's wet, dry, and maybe what your soil temps were and you know, try to take the test again, the same time of year, similar conditions. Um, and that way they're, you're comparing more apples to apples and because it's a living system, it's, it's going to vary each time you take the test, depending on the season and conditions in the soil. Mr. Radish, David Brandt, here's a question for you. Tim asks, 
I've heard radish mentioned several times and know the benefits of the deep tap roots, but there is a rumor that radish seeded in late July after wheat can impact drain tile. Have you seen that? Not the first year. Uh, I've not seen it happen the first year. Uh, any of this, we've probably sent off 50 different samples of roots that everybody brings us that uh, says it's our cover crop that's plugged the tile. And it always comes back, either it's been a grass, such as foxtail or a wheat crop. And it'll take, it'll take uh, as long as two to three years for that root to go down in that tile and grow enough root mass to actually slow the flow down and plug it. And if you looked at the tile system, it's probably where there was a slight elevation change and the water tends to lay a quarter to a half inch deep in a little pocket. And that's where that plant will grow and cause the plug. I would agree 100%. Most of those issues where it becomes chronic are symptomatic of grades that weren't held quite right and waters wanting to stand in the bottom. That's why those plant roots are going there and, and proliferating. I take it as a, a good sign when I get roots going that deep and, and that numerous. I don't tend to worry about it. They will rot. I know it's frustrating in the short run, but I don't, I would agree with David. I don't, I don't think radish is probably your, your big concern or I'd be more worried about ryegrass and, and, and the grasses, like he said. Uh, David Brandt, the question Mark has is, do you fill the roller with water for extra weight? In our case, no. I think our, we have a 20 foot with wings on it that we fold. And I, and I think in our case, We've not seen a case where we probably should have ever put water in. Now, I'm not saying we wouldn't at some point in time, and uh, but we're remember we're long-term no-till. Maybe the first year as going into covers where the ground hasn't had a chance to to loosen up, uh, have enough earthworms to make it loose. You might have to add a little bit, but uh, always remember if you do, make sure you take it out if you're in a climate that tends to freeze in the winter time because. Uh, we can sell you another pretty easy next spring, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, David Kleinschmidt, Kevin asked this question. How does the alo aliopathic effect of CRI minimize weed plants while at the same time allow the cash crop to grow? And he states that he's using cereal rye in a vegetable environment. So the cereal rye is primarily the, the, the chemical or the allelopathic uh, chemical toxin of that plant is primarily going to have more to do on small seeded broadleaves. Um, you know, if you think about like pigweed, for instance, you know, Palmer amaranth got 500,000 seeds per plant, right? So it's incredibly tiny. And so it's kind of two parts there. The, the allelopathic chemical doesn't allow that to germinate or it just makes it extremely weak. The other thing is, is that most weeds grow in high nitrate environments. And with that cereal rye growing, it's taking up that excess nitrogen, uh, nitrate nitrogen that's in that soil profile. So you have more of ammonium and organic nitrogen in there. And, you know, weeds can't utilize that as, as efficiently to grow. Um, the larger seeded, you know, um, our, our crops that we plant, typically, you know, no, there's no allelopathic that we see from them. Um, you know, to switch gears a little bit, we're seeing some allelopathic activity from our sedan grasses and forage sorghums when we plant wheat or cereal rye after that. And we're not seeing that with the millet. So, you know, Knowing what our next cash crop or crop or even vegetable that we're going to plant um, and then plant different cover crops to minimize that, that impact would be what you need to be looking at as well. And we can sure help you with that. Along that line, David, Maggie from Southwest Iowa, there is a hen bit, bit problem in the area. 
and her operator is advising uh, her to spray 2,4-D this fall to, to control the hand bit for next year. So anything other than cereal or I will be killed in our fall cover crop. What advice would you give her? You know, I wish I would have sent this picture to you, Gabe. Um, one of the seed corn companies here locally have been using a lot of, of oats and radishes on their production fields. And um, this past spring, they had, uh, it just looked like they, they ran out of seed on, on a path. And there was no hen bit all the way up to where they ran out of seed. And it was solid hen bit after that. So, you know, just having that, that living root and some biomass out there growing can help with that. Now, if the hen bit is emerged and growing at the time of planting that cover crop, it might need to be addressed at that time. It just depends on how thick it is. So scalp and, and determine. Okay, thank you, David. Nature Trust is a vacuum. Go ahead. Nature abhors a vacuum. Yeah. And if Put something out there. Maybe those weeds come away with it. Don't. And maybe we shouldn't even think of them as weeds. Maybe they're there for a purpose. And maybe we should let them fulfill their purpose. They, they don't grow by accident. So uh, there's a lot of different ways to look at that. Yeah. Change the way you see things. That's right, Dan. Justin asked this. He's wanting to convert from a typical corn bean rotation to a model similar to David Brandt's with a year of small grain and cover. He's located in central Iowa. His test plot is currently in corn and looking to follow the combine with a no-till drill beginning in October. Planning on cereal rye, David Brandt, is there anything else you would add to the cereal rye? And he's a cereal rye and he's going back to beans then or do you know, Gabe? Does not say there. If he's, go if he's going back to beans, he can use cereal rye, uh, Ethiopian cabbage, and rape would be three, uh, three, by, uh, three species I would use there, you know, and uh, that way he'd have a lot of nitrogen sucked up that the corn didn't use and be ready to go to beans and have the root mass that we need to get deep. Okay. Kent Solberg asks a good question here. Uh, he wants uh, David Brandt or David Kleinschmidt to discuss how to determine if you would use a if you would use herbicide termination versus roller crimper termination. David Brandt, you want to start? Well, if if it's uh, if it's time for us to be planting corn and a cover crop has not went to uh, head or bloom stage, we will probably use the roller and a little bit of herbicide just because we don't need to uh, uh, use as much because a roller will help lay it down you know uh, uh, if the plant is mature uh, that's when we decide to roll it and not use any herbicide David Kleinschmidt anything Dan yeah it's really going to depend on your location you know the further north you get um Roller cramper is probably not even going to be in your vocabulary to even use um, where you know, the herbicide is going to be. In fact, the other thing is you know, what's Mother Nature telling you is, has it been incredibly dry um, and before you're planting your cash crop and that cover crop's out there and you know it's utilizing water as well. So that might be a time when you might think about doing some early termination with a herbicide um, if it is incredibly wet or, or wetter than normal let the cover crop grow because it's going to be sucking up a lot of that moisture out of that soil profile and then you know if you're in an environment where you can use a roller crimper you know by all means use it the more that we can get that cover crop though on that soil surface the, the quicker we're going to build soil health you know, there's so many impacts, positive impacts of rolling down a cover crop. It's kind of like that previous question with the soybeans and being a trifoliate behind. You know, if you plant into 30 inch trit and didn't roll it down, those soybeans 
are trying to compete with that canopy for sunlight. So it's ex- expelling a lot of its energy and growing stem to try to get above that canopy. And then it's going to start putting on more trifoliates. So, you know, we have to kind of understand what we're doing here a little bit with those um, cover crops and, and on an agronomic lease as well. Thank you, David. Uh, Terry is wanting to know if any of you have tried interseeding into your corn or beans to get an early start with cover crops. Dan, have you tried that at all? Uh, yeah, we've we've made several attempts at that and had good success getting things started. And uh, by the time the corn reaches tassel, we've got a nice green blanket down under there. But our experience has been that if we have a good dense canopy of a corn crop that very little of that survives till fall. And the only places we see it after harvest then is on the end rows where you turn and have gaps in the canopy that allowed sunlight down in. So that hasn't been a great strategy for us yet. Um, now, could we, could we be planning a little earlier and enhance it? Could we use different species? Open questions. I love the concept. I think we need to learn how to grow multiple plants at the same time, but so far we haven't been able to make it work very well. David Brandt? Uh, my comment's the same as Dan's. Uh, we do pretty well to establish it, but by the time we take the corn out or the beans out, there's not much left, you know. So we've been chasing the harvester with the drill. I think Anyone else? Think comments? Dan? It, if you're really going to be successful, you need to look at maybe widening your corners out to 40 or 60 inches. The guys that have done that have really excellent results. And if you're combining grazing with grain crop production, that, that may be a wonderful optimization. Mm-hmm. And it just, you know, so- I might go ahead. Well, it's going to add that in corn, following corn, you know, I want a cereal rye. Um, ahead of that soybeans, right? And cereal rye interseeding in the corn is going to work real well. The, um, the the comment Dan made about the wider roads, interesting thing about that, going back to that picture of that corn plant, the corn coming up in that mix in Southern Illinois, um, that was actually 38 inch row corn. So the farmer went from 20 inch corn to a 38 inch row. He didn't have to interseed because all of his oats and vetch, everything reseeded itself. And so in that picture right there, he had zero pounds of uh, nitrogen fly, no phosph, no potassium, and that field averaged right at 170. And at harvest time, that field was completely green. Hmm. So he still has half his shed sitting full of seed that he bought last fall that he didn't even have to see. And this this photo is is one where I believe the the cover crop was seeded the same time as the corn, and and. Uh, you can see it up and going, but that that obviously is going to, the cover is going to be mature before the corn uh, gets to canopy. So Shane knew there was a question here about how many Haney tests should you pull in an 80 acre field? Well, you know, the soil type is pretty much the same and you don't have a lot of contrast in the soil and the cropping has been the same. You know, I would probably take, you know, three to four samples locations, put it in a five gallon bucket, mix it together and send it off as one composite sample. <clears throat> now, if you have like a, it's a valley, you like some bottom land going up a, a hill, you know, I would break the difference there and split it, you know, separate the lower land versus a higher elevation land. You know, those be, extra, you know, two different soil types. Then you'll take two locations on one side, two locations on the other, 
still mix them together and send it off as one composite as long as it's been farmed, you know, the same crop in, in those fields. Thank you, Shane. I want to remind anyone who's interested in learning more uh, about the Soil Health Academy coming up at Dan DeSutter's August 3rd through the 5th in Attica, Indiana. Go to our Soil Health Academy website. And as you see there, we also have an online course available, Regen Ag 101. And if you attend that academy, you would receive the Regen Ag 101 along with the tuition to the academy. So with that, I wanna thank uh, David Brandt, Dan DeSutter, David Kleinschmidt, and all of you who joined us today for this webinar. Our next webinar will be on July 29th when we're gonna talk about cover crop planting decisions. I wanna thank everyone for joining us. Wish you a safe and successful season. Thank you. Thanks everyone.